Hello, all neuroplasticians out there. I'm here with Jennifer Fraser today. How are you, Jennifer? I'm great, thank you. Oh, it's good to see you. Jennifer, we're here to talk about your work um, and the bullied brain um, and your expertise in this environment of applied neuroscience. So I'm really eager to jump right into it. Um, Jennifer, tell us your journey into this work and how it came about and tell us the road to uh, finding this area of expertise. Well, uh, actually almost to the date of the publication of my book, which was April 1st, 2022, The Bully Brain, uh, 10 years prior, I was involved in a situation at a private school where I was being told that the conduct of teachers to students was just old school coaching. And, you know, just that kind of, you know, toughen them up for a tough world. And there's so there's lots of yelling and screaming in the face and tons of humiliation and threats and fear and uh, swearing and homophobic slurs. And so I'm a researcher by trade. I, my PhD is in comparative literature. So what we were trained to do is take different discourses and put them into the arena, pull them out of their silos, put them in the arena and see if the conversation changed based on the fact that they weren't in their silos. And so I took oh. bullying, all forms of bullying. So all forms of abuse, bullying, microaggressions. I took that information and I put it into the arena with neuroscience. And I found out that in fact, it is not just old school coaching. We have 20 years of research that shows that all that kind of treatment to children or to adults. So bullying in the workplace, bullying in your home, bullying at school or in sports, it causes neurological damage to the brain. It can be seen on a brain scan. And what shocked me was that I never really, I'm an educator. I've been an educator for 20 years. First of all, I didn't, I hadn't been informed about the brain, taught about the brain, understood it as, a, as that critical tool for learning and, and self-regulation and all these things. So it was a real eye-opener for me and being a teacher I wanted everybody to know how serious it is. So just, you know, for your neuroplasticians that, you know, this is their language, this is their world. What I learned was bullying and abuse in all forms leave neurological scars on the brain. So that's the really bad news part of my book, the bullied brain, neurological scars. It damages all kinds of uh, regions of the brain. It damages the corpus callosum by stripping it of myelination. Right, um, right. It, it enlarges the amygdala because it becomes hypervigilant and it's, it's always looking for threat. It, um, it can shrivel the hippocampus to the point where it looks like a, a prune or a raisin. And everything that I'm saying is documented in extensive peer-reviewed replicated research. So I ultimately got Dr. Uh, Michael Merznick, who you would all know him, he's the father of neuroplasticity. He's one of the most highly awarded neuroscientists alive today. And um, by just extreme generosity, and because he cares about kids, he agreed to read the book and then he just, it became a passion project for him because I gathered all this research together, all these different brilliant minds and neuro, neuroscientists and, and took it and made it a neuroplastician project. I'm applying it to the world so that everybody knows, not just the scientists in the laboratory, I want everyone to know. And that's why I'm super excited to be in this community. Like this is a dream come true for me. Well, it's a dream come true for me to have you here, but only if you bring uh, Michael to join us in a round table, <laughs> Jennifer, but obviously his work is incredible. And the fact that you've got his endorsement is kudos to your, your, your expertise. In this environment, we're really looking at the pracademia. We're not going to get lost in Mersnick um, level of academic literature, which is obviously what we base our practical uh, school skills on. But in terms of your environment, who do you help? Do you work with teachers or children or coaches? I mean, who is the person that gets to feel the brilliance of Jennifer? Um, it's really because I work on adults who bully children, I'm really working very much in the education sector and in mm -hmm. the sports sector. I mean, I coach private clients as well. It's very applicable to the workplace too. Um, what's really exciting about it is that, yes, we can see these neurological scars. Yes, they are on brain scans. They're visible. And what I also learned was the brain, as your community knows, the brain is remarkably 
adept at repair and recovery. So the book is designed, so the subtitle of the book is, it's the bullied brain, but the subtitle is where the real work happens. Heal your scars and restore your health. Now, most people don't know that they have neurological scars in their brain from bullying and abuse in their lives. They don't know that these interactions in the workplace, for example, the microaggressions or the outright bullying that occurs, very aggressive, destructive behaviors or social relational bullying or cyber mm. bullying, all these things, this negative environment that gets created around it is poison for the brain. What's super exciting is there is a ton of research on how our brains are wired, innately wired to heal and repair. So in the book, I spend 10 chapters. I teach the, the sort of core components of applied neuroscience. So neuroplastician work, like how can we work with our neuroplasticity to get better? And then I go through all the different other activities that we can do, ranging from brain training, very specific localized brain training, to mindfulness, to um, aerobic exercise. And I do a bunch of sort of visualization and, and actually exercises where you speak to the brain. It's a lot about learning to divest yourself of the mind bully, the internalized aggressor, and replace that figure with an empathic coach, a talent whisperer. So yeah, the book is full of, of pracademia. It's all about the general reader and helping anyone from a teenager to somebody in their 90s who still has neuroplasticity and can change their brain and recover. Wow, this is so, so interesting. I can't tell you how how many questions I've got. But let me start with, with a question that I just want to ask. It's just me being uh, interested in your conversations with, with, with Michael Mersnick. When you were speaking to him, did he, um, did he speak about the neurotransmission around neuroplasticity? Did that come up at all in your conversation with him or with anybody else? Did, did that realm uh, come up at all? Neurotransmission in what sense? The, the neurotransmitters, like the role of dopamine or cortisol in the in the experience of uh, bullying or in anything like that. Yes, absolutely. So the at the very start of the book, I talk extensively, and then throughout, unfortunately, I talk about the cortisol and what it actually is doing to the brain and the body when somebody is under threat when they are faced with an aggressor, when they think they're, they've got a predator there, when they're activating the sympathetic nervous system. Absolutely, we spent a lot of time on cortisol. Now, I did not, you know, I could have done actually a better job when I look back, I could have done a better job of really emphasizing how much we can control how we experience things by means of our neurotransmitters, like in, in the sense of, you know, do you look at the glass half full? Yes, you do. And you're excited and it's wonderful. And you flood your brain with dopamine and serotonin. <laughs> um, on the flip side, you can look at that glass and see scarcity and anxiety and depression and that it's half empty. And then you're activating your cortisol. I didn't do a great job of that in the book, in fact, but I'm, it's something that I'm really focused on now with my new book, um, which is not completed. It's called The Gaslit Brain. And I have the wonderful advantage of having a greatly generous and intelligent and just an all around amazing person, Elizabeth Gould has stepped into the final third part of the book. And so she and I are more focused on, on neurotransmission in that sense. I'm sorry, I was on mute, I was coughing. I was just saying, Ellie, if you're, you're, listen, if you're listening, Ellie, we, we're on your team, you're awesome. Um, but before we get lost in uh, Ellie's brilliance, the neurotransmitters aren't important to, you know, to know the Latin. It doesn't help the practitioner so much. And the, the neuroplastician might help to know what's going on so that they can shift behavior through using tools. So in the environment of the, the neuroplastician, we're interested in learning what are the hacks that work to make a shift. So the first thing to understand is what is the what is the thing that you notice? Is it is it a fear response? Is it chronic stress? Is it states of anxiety? Is it 
You know, is it overwhelm and depression? Is it everything? Is it specifically something else? What is the thing that falls on your uh, on your lap when you in practice, Jennifer? Well, I mean, in the book, in a sense, one of the ways you could look at it is that um, all forms of bullying and abuse are activating your sympathetic nervous system. So right. you're slipping very unconsciously, in a sense, you're slipping into fight, flight, or freeze. And mm -hmm. so I talk about this whole cycle as a cycle. So I try to sidestep the idea that we need to blame and shame individuals who use very aggressive behaviors. I, there's no point in that. All they're doing is acting out the fight. I mean, the sympathetic nervous system response. So they're pumping their brains up with cortisol. They're damaging the empathy neural networks in their brain. They're damaging their mirror neuron system all the time that they're doing the abuse that they do. And as we know, in our society, we allow these people uh, to do what they do with impunity often. They're, they're not held accountable. And we think that we're protecting them oftentimes. Oh, we protect the perpetrator and we re-victimize the victim. So I'm trying to say, look, it's time for a scientific revolution in this field, very specifically. It's time for us to say, we've got 20 years of research that shows that all forms of bullying and abuse damage the bully's brain and damage the abuser's brain and damage the victim's brain. Why are we allowing the damage of these incredible brains to happen at all? We need to exit what I call the bullying and abuse paradigm. And we need to enter into a new neuro paradigm. And the neuro paradigm is brain informed. It's what all of we do together. We are a community that says, we have to know about the brain in order to fulfill our potential, in order to care for others, to have a cohesive society, in order to raise our children to be strong and happy and well. Um, so, I mean, that's really the driving force behind what I do. There's, there's so many people in the community, which is very, um, very, very complementary to your philosophy. Then we are a community of expert learners who want to hear more about what you're doing. So, you know, we can all go buy a book and I'm sure most of us will, and I'll carry on reading it for sure. And my, my, my thinking is that there might be something for us to explore here in a round table with everybody. I mean, I don't know how, up, up you, how open you are to having a conversation with some of the neuroplasticians. Let's get them into um, a room together and let's have I mean, a space to think out what is going on in the neurophysiology of the bullied and the bullier, if those are even the right phrases. Um, but it would be really interesting to know, you know how we can translate this work um, into the home, into the school, into the workplace, you know, into the sports field that you mentioned as well, which is, which is something I'd quickly like to understand because I, I don't know I don't know how bullying shows up on the sports field but it's kind of the whole point of being the bullier when you're playing uh, football or something I would imagine but tell me a little bit about that Jennifer and then um and then we can see if that's okay would you mind telling me a bit about your work in the sports environment mm -hmm. so uh definitely round table that would be really exciting and I will mm -hmm. ask uh, Michael if he has time to join us he's very open to um, working with people who are applying neuroplasticity. So that would be exciting and interesting. And, and wow. I'd love to hear from all the other people in the group too. So cool. one of the ways in which um, sports are used, they're essentially used as a cover up for abuse. So okay. it's a very, people will think it's a fine line between being demanding, you know, you think football and rugby and all these kinds of things and being demeaning. So when you're a demanding coach, really what you're trying to do is help your athletes fulfill their potential. You want them to reach for the stars. You want them to connect as a team so that they know everything about each other, anticipate what one another is going to do. They have this high level of flow and empathy, and they just work like this incredible, well-oiled machine. That's the demanding coach. And the demanding coach believes you can do anything you set your mind to. And they think of all these different diverse ways that they can reach athletes with their, their different brains and the different way they process information. And they, they really get to know them. Now, the demeaning coach, on the other hand, is somebody who creates an atmosphere of humiliation and fear and favoritism. And what they do is they favor people, the beneficiaries of the bullying regime, they favor people who don't have the meritocracy necessarily to get the opportunities that they do, but they will be very intense defenders of the coach or the teacher or, or the boss 
when, when push comes to shove and reports of abuse are starting to pile up, they will defend to the ends of the earth the individual that does it because they're the beneficiaries of this regime. Okay. Just think politics right now. There's a lot yes. of people politically who benefit from highly abusive behaviors on the part of lead politicians, and they just check their morals at the door. They check even their integrity and the, mm. their past statements that they've made because they want the power and they'll they'll sell sell their souls for it. It's like that. Sure, this sounds so so sociologically complicated, and really like to have some time to dig into the social neuroscience on this. That would be so interesting. Jennifer, I'm, I'm hypnotized by your work. I'm so um, humbled by the fact that you know Michael Mizzet. If you if, if you get him into a conversation with us, I'll, I'll promise I won't break into tears or start being inappropriate. It'll be so cool to meet him. But um, your, your work has really shown uh, value and there's a lot of people working in education there's a lot of professors in education in this environment there's people that are interested in how to translate your work so let's let's put together a round table i'm definitely going to be interested in and i know there many others are so thank you jennifer it's so good to see you again and thank you so much for for showing up as part of the community i'm looking forward to our um, next steps in the round table together Yes, thank you so much, Justin. It was wonderful to speak with you today. Okay, take care now. Bye-bye.